Thank you. Um, I'm Dusty Pascoe. Uh, I'm from Raywood in northern Victoria, and I'm presenting on the benefits of grazing crops to fill a winter feed gap in a changing climate. Uh, back in 2019, when you start your Nuffield journey, you think about how the next 18 months will go and you play out all scenarios in your head. I thought I had it about right, but oh, how wrong I was. Mm. Uh, when I talk to people in the room over the last few days, they all turn their heads and look at you. You're one of those scholars. Yeah. It's kind of like your dog died or something like that. Yeah. Mm. Um, but it has taken exceptional patience uh, from my investor, GRDC. Um, uh, and they're waiting for a return on investment uh, of me to give back to them. Uh, not only them, it's the kind generosity and the patience of GRDC, but Nuffield Australia as well, uh, who are equally as patient with us. Uh, and a farmer from Raywood, he was able to make his first overseas trip. Um, after a few false starts and a fair few tears, uh, my three girls there and my wife, um, I was the one who was crying though, um, <laughs> They're all about a foot tall, or that was at the start of COVID, that one. Um, yeah, I got my first international plunge, which I was very grateful for. So Pasco Farms is home, as I say, in Raywood in northern Victoria. Um, it's a true mixed farm. Uh, we're 40% sheep, approximately, self-replacing merinos, dabble in a few crossbreds as well. Um, a small feedlot as well um, to deal with different times. 60% um, of the farm is uh, broadacre crop, so we're talking wheat, oats, barley, export hay. Um, and we're trying to integrate those two enterprises while um, going for maximum profitability with uh, a reduced amount of risk um, is always front of mind. And it's that drive for balance and profit um, and the risk um, levels that we're comfortable with that leads me to my next question. What are the seven most expensive words in farming? Does anyone know? We've always done it that way. That's the way we've always done it, exactly. Uh, this was said to me by Rob Coleman. Um, he was an Irish fella, but he's always asking questions why and how. Um, he was using grazing crops uh, for the regen ag benefits, um, but also integrating livestock into um, his cropping system, gave him greater flexibilities with his sowing windows, as well as uh, reduced costs and greater profit. We'll come back to him in a little bit. First, we need to get some context of grazing crops to, grazing crops to fill a winter feed gap in a changing climate. Sounds pretty simple. Grow a crop, throw a few sheep at it. No dramas. Um, and to be fair, as I travelled around, there was heaps of people who were grazing crops. But when you ask a few more questions, genuinely, uh, it was unintentional grazing. The sheep had just got out and were on the, on the crops. <laughs> Um, so at home, uh, our issue is when we're cropping, we've got 60% of the farm tied up in cropping, um, but it's also the time of year where we're lambing down. And so we've got these sheep, they've only got 40% of the land to run on, um, but their megajoule requirement or the amount of feed that they need is at its peak. So we're getting a mismatch in that feed. Um, so that's the identifying the feed gap. On the cropping side, we often sow dry, um, so you might have something like your barley program all sown in the ground before you get your first germinating rains. So all of that can be coming through on the same day effectively. It's not so bad at the time that you sow, but at the other end of the season, when it's all getting up to flowering and you get a frost, you can wipe off a lot of dollars very, very quickly. So grazing these crops can manipulate that flowering window and reduce that risk there. Um, on the changing climate part of it, uh, we live in Australia. Um, Australia's always had a varying climate. Uh, we can go from having lush, great feed in the paddock to sheep coming out of a feedlot to lamb down on full um, rations. Uh, this is only going to get worse in the future as our climate changes around. So grazing crops is just another tool in the toolbox. Where do you sit in grazing crops? Uh, that's an important thing to do. Uh, there's a big difference between a crop farmer who has sheep and a sheep farmer who has crops. Uh, the crop farmer, he will keep the sheep well away from his crops and doing everything in his power to get those crops as good as you can get. And a livestock farmer, uh, they're always looking at the other side of it. They're planting the crops specifically to feed their sheep. And you say, take them off so you can get the crop. And then, no, 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 she's right, the sheep will be fine. Um, for me, I'm a bit more in the middle and I'm always trying to aim for maximum productivity. I want to grow the best crop that I can, but I'm also trying to get the best out of my sheep as well. 
And on my travels, I found other farmers that had that similar point of view. So Belgay Farms. Um, I got onto Belgay Farms. Uh, it was a mate from Nuffield. Um, he was over in Ireland. Uh, he sent me an article. Um, the article was in a Scottish uh, journal over there. And uh, I was able to track down, the, the article was all about grazing crops. I was able to track down the actual farm where the trials were held and got onto Ian Wilkinson, told him I was from Nuffield. He was keen, welcoming, got across there, it was absolutely fantastic. And then that led on to other leads as well. Um, I only put this in there just for the power of the Nuffield. You ring them up, say, I'm from Nuffield. He had nothing to do with it but knew of it and, yeah, was so welcoming with it. Uh, and the Nuffield shirt as well, um, I got across to uh, Groundswell over in the UK. I didn't get 50 metres in the gate. I walked in, some bloke pointed me out, I know that shirt, come across and talk to you and you make connections. Just absolutely fa fantastic. Um, someone once said to me with Nuffield, doors slam open. Mm. Mm. Um, Belgay, anyway, uh, I digress there, sorry. Uh, Belgay had been grazing crops since 2018, um, or they officially, they had been doing it longer, but in 2018 they did their official trials that was um, in this article. Um, that was because of impaired grass growth, so the same problems we have. They were looking for the extra feed in a drying climate, which is hard to fathom over there. Uh, they all kept saying it was drought while I was over there and it hadn't rained for four weeks. Yeah. Um, the good part was in their trials, they were actually getting hard data. They were going across, they were grazing oats, wheat, barley, and they were putting an electric fence right down the middle of their crops and grazing half and not the other half. So it's not just dairy fairy data, it is hard data. Um, and we're talking really big crops. You can see in the photo there, um, they're talking 14 tonne wheat crops. They're not small. Uh, on that, Specifically in the barley, they were finding that they were getting half a tonne to 0.75 of a tonne per hectare yield increase on the grazed parts of the crops. But as well as this, they're finding their sowing window, they were getting in um, two to three weeks in earlier. Um, this was a big thing for them because they get the rains come in, um, it gets boggy and they bugger their soil structure with the, uh, a bit like Fritz, uh, with that soil structure, when it gets too wet, you just can't put the machines on it. Uh, Rob Coleman, he was the fella um, uh, that I mentioned earlier. He's just one of those blokes. He just had go about him. He's excitable. Uh, it's just contagious. It's a bit like talking to Jared Amory, uh, whoever knows him. You just can't help but get excited when you talk to him. Mm -hmm. So Rob's farm was down in Cork. Um, he was mainly doing arable crops, but he had stuff going on everywhere. He had compost piles. Uh, he had mixes. He had grain storage. Uh, he had all sorts of stuff. Uh, and as I say, he was asking why and how and how can he um, improve all the time. All his decisions were driven by profit and sustainability. Um, he was using both his own sheep and bought in cattle, um, or own sheep and cattle, and um, he also punted sheep as well. But he was identifying with the grazing of the crops. He could get a feed bank there. Um, he knew that he had a feed bank of, say, four weeks in the grazing crops. He would buy in those lambs, punt those lambs for the four weeks, and then get the gain there. Um, and he could do that without affecting yield, if not increasing yield. But he was taking it to the next step again, um, and he was planting cover crops. Uh, this was for a combination of reasons. He didn't have the tile drainage and stuff. So it was to remove moisture, but also to try and add some nitrogen. And he was getting the um, ruminant cycling by adding livestock into that side as well. Um, he was finding that he was getting reduced tangible costs. So uh, growth regulators that they use over there from getting big bulky crops that fall over, um, he was able to cut back on those. He had reduced fertiliser inputs as well and he also enjoyed the, um, the better sowing window before the ground got too boggy. Mm -hmm. uh, Gareth. <laughs> I met Gareth at a BASE conference. Uh, BASE stands for Biodiversity, Agriculture, Soil and Environment. It's a, it's a bit like a Vic No Till group. Um, I went to that conference over there with this fella in the photo, uh, Robbie Byrne. He's a fellow, fellow Nuffield scholar. Um, Gareth was uh, voted Soil Farmer of the Year by his peers at that conference. Um, and he was a very interesting farmer. Um, he was a pure arable farmer and also had a contracting business as well. 
Uh, he didn't actually like sheep, but he recognised that in his cropping business, he needed to get an animal in there um, to get his system right. Uh, so how he got around that one, uh, also he'd also lost the infrastructure as well because they had been cropping for so long. Um, he was adjusting, uh, getting adjustment. So he was getting neighbours, uh, whoever else, getting them in using electric fences so he didn't have to worry about it um, and yeah, was getting his profits that way. But he was also getting profits from the lower inputs because of that ruminant cycling, um, but also getting increased yield. And for him, harvest flow was a big one. So uh, by taking off some of that uh, excess biomass, he was getting better, um, easier harvesting. But the biggest thing for him was soil structure. Uh, he was all about his soils and getting his soils right. So what have we learned? Timing is king. With anything in farming, uh, everyone here would know you've got to get stuff done on time. Um, there is a lot of benefits to it uh, if done well, um, but the big thing is you've got to get your crop in early. Um, you've got reduced risks, um, such as the flowering windows, but also the likes of floods last year. The crops that I'd grazed, at least I'd got something back before they got wiped out. Uh, so it is uh, a benefit that way. Uh, it's high quality feed when you're reduced of it. You can increase your stocking rate. Uh, manipulating that flowering window is a big one for me um, and easier harvesting as well. But it's not all beer and Skittles. You can stuff it up really quickly. Um, I have done that myself as well. Mm. Um, it, you can decrease the yield, especially if you nip off that first node. Um, uh, can require more inputs as well um, if you're trying to get that biomass up and going again. Um, and a bit more management as well. You've got to keep an eye on those sheep, got to keep an eye on those crops. Um, and infrastructure requirements as well, uh, such as with Gareth. So how do we maximise it? How do we get the most out of grazing crops? Sowing early uh, is a big one, uh, getting that window to get it in um, and then grazing hard and fast. As soon as that uh, tug and pull test where you can bend down, grab your grass and pluck it without pulling the roots out, uh, you can go from any time there. Uh, you want to graze early before growth stage 30. So in cereal crops, you've got 100 different stages. Um, growth stage 30 is where you start getting that first node coming through. And as I say, uh, if you nip that off, you will severely uh, impact your yield. Uh, don't com compromise on timing. You are still growing the crop. The crop is the key. Um, if you've got a spread, if you've got a spray, don't leave the animals on there for any longer. Take them off. Uh, stag your dates if you can uh, to try and maximise it. Um, not always possible, but if you can stagger your dates so you're reducing that frost risk at the other end. Um, monitoring your stock and crops. As I say, it's not all beer and skittle. You can get things like pregtox and stuff with the high quality feed. Um, without the calcium there, you may need to put supplements such as hay or a cal calcium magnesium mix or something like that in there as well. So you've got to monitor your stock there. Um, and the biggest thing is probably enjoy it. Um, if you don't enjoy it, it's not really sustainable farming, is it? So the moral of the story is grazing crops is just another tool in the arsenal uh, that you can use in a mixed farm. And if done well, it can increase your whole farm profitability. Further questions that I have, how do we standardise the value of grazing crops? Uh, there was a lot of people who just had warm, fuzzy feelings and uh, I prefer a bit of data um, to that. Um, but there's a lot of things that is really, really hard to quantify. Um, some people giving, I felt, inflated values and some people weren't giving enough value. Uh, in the case of, say, Ian, Ian Wilkinson at Belge, um, that was an easy one. You can see the yield increase. Um, you can quantify that quite easily. Or Rob, um, he had the high value on the early sowing, but how do you put a number on that? Um, the lambs that he punted for Rob, that's pretty easy. Meat value times price uh, or meat kilos times price. Gareth for his soil benefits and timely harvest. Again, how do you put a dollar value on that? That's a hard one. Uh, I personally rate it back to the amount of grazing days that I get off uh, a crop uh, and then relate it back to if I had to feed them in a feed lot to get my uh, cents per head per day. Um, but it also has limitations. So if you're putting condition on a U while it's lactating, uh, that's money in the bank there. Uh, but how do you quantify that again? So it's not all uh, easy to quantify. Um, 
when should we avoid, uh, be avoiding grazing crops and uh, which years are the best to graze crops to maximise returns uh, are further questions that I have as well. The good news is there's lots of research um, both locally and from GRDC are doing a heap of articles and stuff on it. Um, this one in the picture is a local trial site, it's only 20k from home where we're doing all different trials on grazing canola. Mm. Uh, next step for me. Where to? Uh, I have a little bit more travel to do. I'm heading off to New Zealand in January, February is the plan uh, before I finish my report. Um, and how do I give back for the GRDC? So uh, I currently hold roles with the producer advisory panel for Best Wool, Best Lamb in Victoria um, and also on the advisory panel for the Bendigo Livestock Exchange, which gives me great access to producers throughout southeastern um, uh, Australia. Um, Rural Bank has also contacted and wants to do podcasts so we can share these findings with the wider community. Um, but again, I just want to thank Nuffield, GRDC, for the opportunity that I've been able to um, do. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>